Good morning. I want to invite you to come on in and grab a seat. I want to welcome you all to worship today. We are so glad that you have joined us here uh, on this Father's Day. And, uh, and, and one of the things we're going to do to honor the fathers is uh, give them a little bit of a teaser here with some beef jerky. So is that not a manly thing to do? So dads, don't all run out there at once, but on the welcome table right out there, uh, in the foyer area, uh, grab yourself a packet of beef jerky. We thought about giving you roses, but we decided just to go with the beef jerky. So, anyway, and if you don't, if you if you don't eat the beef jerky, it's okay. I'll eat the rest once you all leave. So, happy Father's Day to you. Uh, we come here to worship our Father in heaven, who loves us and who knows us, and who is over all things. And uh, you know, it's a great day just to remember what what fatherhood is meant to be, and our Father in heaven is the source of what that is. Um, I'm not going to start preaching today because uh, I'm, I'm taking the day off from preaching. We got a, a quote-unquote guest preacher that I'll introduce. You might be familiar with him uh, here in a little bit, but anyway, a couple of announcements. I do want to run your way. Um, if you would like to fill out a Connect card, please do so, and you can tear this off in your bulletin. I note that there are places for prayer requests and that sort of thing. We'd love to pray for you and be connected with you. You can place that in our offering basket, which is near the exits. Uh, there's a little basket in either of those exits. You can put it in there. A couple of quick announcements I want to call to your attention. Our monthly Alzheimer's support group meets uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock. So note that if you want to be a part of that. And then uh, also important is that uh, we are now beginning a search for a new director of worship ministries. Um, you may not have known this, but Jamie has been an interim for 13 months. And I don't know when you stop being an interim. I don't know if you, I, mean, I guess we're all interim, right, Rich? I mean, we're all interim, but uh, we are looking to fill that position more, quote unquote, uh, permanently. So be praying for that. There's information about that in your bulletin. If you know somebody who you think might be good to apply for that, then please uh, direct them to me, uh, or you can have them uh, just uh, contact the church office. We'd love to get uh, people connected there, and uh, we want to cast as wide of a net as we possibly can. Uh, and then finally, we are selling t-shirts for the youth in the back, uh, for the uh, their youth mission t-shirts. Ryan will be back there. Uh, feel free to go and buy one of those. They're cool-looking shirts, and there's information about that in your bulletin as well. And then finally, part of what we do as a church uh, as worship is we give. Giving financially is a part of what it means to worship, and there's several ways that you can give here at Wolforth Methodist. You can go online at wolfworthumc.com uh, or dot, dot org slash giving. Uh, you can mail a check here to 1010 Donald Preston Drive. Or you can text GIVE to 806-607-8484. And that's a part of our worship uh, together. All right. I think that's all we got by way of announcements. That's almost as hard as preaching. Um, but why don't I invite you to stand, and I want to pray us into, the, in, into worship today. Would you please stand? Lord, we just bring ourselves before you today. Oh, Lord, we just lift our hearts up. We just pray that you would send your Holy Spirit today. To be in our hearts, oh God. We give you honor and praise and glory. And we bow down and we worship the God of the universe. We love you, Lord. We thank you that we get to sing songs that give glory to you and that remind us of who you are. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
I invite you to be seated as we enter into a time of prayer together. Lord, we just lift up our hearts before you today. We lift up just the world that we live in, especially. First of all, just want to lift up our campers, Lord. We just had middle schoolers finish up camp this week, and we have high schoolers going to camp this next week, and we just pray that the work that you have done this past week in the lives of the campers, that you would just continue that work as they enter back into their world. And we pray right now that you would begin to prepare the hearts of the high schoolers who are going off to see the canyon. And we ask that you would bless and hold and keep the counselors and the directors and the camp staff, and that you would just allow for that moment and that time up at Cedar Canyon to be a time where you truly do meet these young men and women and, and that their lives are changed. Lord, we lift up the city, uh, the town of Perryton, Texas, God, and we just pray, oh God, that you would uh, just let your healing hand be there in the midst of the rubble and the wreckage. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who are grieving. We pray for those family members and, and friends and as uh, those who have lost their homes and lost their possessions and lost things that are so valuable to them, Lord, we just pray that you would um, just embrace that community and let them just have your, your spirit and to know and that you would somehow use this, O oh Lord, to draw people unto yourself. We pray for the churches in that community that they would allow this to be uh, a place and a time where they could be the salt and the light of the world and where that is very apparent uh, to the people in that community. Lord, we lift up our hearts. We lift up uh, the, the places in our hearts that are full of joy and happiness and the wonderful things that we celebrate today. We also lift up the parts of our hearts that are, are anxious, the parts that are worried. Maybe we have decisions that we're wrestling with and it just doesn't always seem to be black and white, and it's not always easy, O oh Lord. And we, we pray that you would teach us, O oh God. We ask that you would help us to be your disciples. As we've been working through the Sermon on the Mount, Lord, just form us and shape us and teach us not just our way, not a worldly way, but a kingdom of heaven kind of way, O oh Lord. We ask that you would help us to really be your disciples over against the ways of this world. Lord, for those of us who um, just need to hear a word from you today, God, would you just come and would you speak to us? Lord, we just give you thanks for this uh, Father's Day, and we thank you uh, that you're a good, good father. And we pray, oh God, that, that those of us who are fathers, that we would be the kind of father that, that you are, that we would be slow to anger, full of compassion, that we would... Um, have high standards for our children, and we just pray in this culture, Lord, a fatherless culture, Lord, we just pray that you would adopt people, that the spirit that came upon Jesus and said, this is my beloved son, would come upon people today, and that we would know, even if, even if we didn't have a good father, oh God, for those of us who didn't, that you still are a good father, and so, Lord, just help us to live into that and to accept that. And to trust you in that. Lord, we just give you thanks for every good thing and every good blessing today. We just pray that you would fill us with your word today. We just pray that you would anoint Rich to preach and teach the word of God. And that we would hear your word and be built up in our faith. That you would cut away the excess and the things that need to be removed from us, oh God. Individually and as a community. And that you would build us up to be the people that, that you want us to be. And so, Lord, as we continue in worship, we just ask that you would help us to live out that prayer that you taught us to pray. Let's pray together, church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow, and you've known about it for four weeks, and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Hmm, <laughs> vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple of hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. A little dad humor for us there. Well, I, uh, when I, a couple of uh, months ago, um, I uh, was looking at my summer calendar and realized that I, I was going to need someone to come preach for me sometime in the month of June, just because I know every now and then I love to just be among the worshiping people and let someone preach. And so um, I just kind of opened up the phone book and looked up preachers, and I, I came across this guy by the name of Rich. And uh, I thought I'd just give him a call. So we have a quote-unquote guest preacher today. Rich, get on up here. Um, so Rich, it, it, for those of you who are new here, Rich has been the pastor here for 12 years. 12 and a half years. Don't want to slot you that half year. 12 and a half years. And um, I got to be his successor. And so uh, this is your first time back since what? January? Yeah, to, to main services. I was at the sunrise service on Easter, okay. but that, yeah, okay. this is the first time back. So um, I, I'm excited. Rich and I go back a good ways, and we've served on different boards and committees and crossed paths over the years, and I was always grateful to have him if I needed to know anything about the general conference of a previous denomination that we were both a part of. I didn't have to go research it for myself. I could just call Rich, <laughs> and I love it when people like that are around, but no, Rich, we're glad that you're here and just jumping right in with us in our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, and, and we're just grateful for 
for you being here among us. So I'm going to get out of your way, and uh, I've already prayed over you, so you're good to go. So I'm going to get out of your way and let you bring the Word of God. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else notice just how much the guy in the video looks like Bailey? I mean, it was, it was starting for a minute. I thought they made the video here in-house. It just looks so much like him. So what Bailey didn't tell you is what I do now is I am the presiding elder for the eastern area of the, of the West Plains Conference of the Global Methodist Church. And so I work with about 50 or so churches on a regular basis. That's my main role now. My wife and family, they're sitting over here. Well, my son's in the sound booth. Uh, um, they're still attending church here, very much involved in the life of the church. We are very appreciative of this church. You have loved us well for a very for, well the entirety of my daughter's life. You have loved us very well, and we are excited to, to just still be a part of this amazing church. If you have questions about the Global Methodist Church or the West Plains Conference of the Global Methodist Church, after service, hit me up. I'll be probably out in the foyer somewhere. You can just grab me and ask any and all questions that you want. I may or may not have the answers, but I'll do my best. Um, let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Open us in heart, mind, and spirit to all that you have for us this day. Help us to experience you in ways we can't explain with our words. Help us to fall deeper in love with you as you love us completely. Just now, dear Father, may the words of my mouth the meditations, thoughts, and reflections of each of our hearts and minds be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever done the right thing for the wrong reason? Right? I think we all do that for for a time or two, or maybe we do it regularly. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason. It's easy to get into a habit and go, well, that's not that big a deal. I mean, at least you did the right thing, right? I might not have had my heart in it. I might not have been all in on it, but I got around to it and I did the right thing. But we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today that I think kind of flips the script on that. Because I think where you look at what Jesus is teaching, right here in the middle, in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, he's giving us this instruction on how to give and how to pray and how to fast where I think at the heart of it, he's communicating to us that it's not just what you do, it's why you do it that's important. It's not just what you do, but why you do it that's important. Our motives in the spiritual life, our motives matter. So if you have your Bibles, you might open them up or turn them on, however you access the Word of God today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, the first 18 verses. We're gonna, I'm just going to give you a little road map. I'm going to go to three parts of it, one after the other, and then we're going to back up to the heart of it. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to start right there at verse 1, for there is a pattern in this text that I want you to see. So we're going to look at verse, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Hear now the Word of God, and I'm working out of the New Living Translation today. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. This is the Word of God. It is true and can be trusted. Amen? So Jesus is giving this example. He's teaching here, and he wants to get to this heart of what it means to give to the needy. Just to give of our financial resources. And he brings up an example, apparently, that everybody would have known. Everybody would have understood it because he starts out with watch out don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others don't do as the hypocrites do did you see it blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to the good that they are doing he's using this because he knows 
He's seen people, they've seen people, they had all seen people who that's exactly how they did their giving. So when they, when they were given an offering at synagogue, you know, their version of passing the plates or the baskets, they wouldn't just kind of put their money in it, they'd hold it high. Anybody ever see the movie The Apostle? Robert Duvall, years and years ago, you may not have seen it, he played a traveling evangelist, a charismatic kind of TV preacher personality. And in the midst of the worship services that they did, you would see the preacher stand up and he'd pull a $100 bill out of his wallet. That's why you know it's fiction. He'd pull a $100 bill out of his wallet and he'd hold it up way high in the air and he'd do this dance down the middle aisle of the church so that everybody could see that he had a $100 bill in his hand and he'd make a big show out of putting it in the plate. What was that about? It's about him, right? It's about him getting the attention for being generous, for giving his money, for doing that. Now, maybe somebody that does it like that, well, I'm leading the congregation. Well, no. You're stealing the attention that belongs to God and putting it upon yourself. That's what you're doing, right? You ever been to a church? <laughs> if this steps on toes, I'm not sorry. You ever been to a church that has a plaque on everything with the name of whoever gave it? I was in a church uh, uh, a few years ago, not this one, because we don't have them, but every pew, there, there, were, there were like 150 pew. every pew had the name of the family who gave the money for that pew. It was like reserving a seat for eternity, like that's your pew, right? Every picture, every room, everything in the church had a plaque on it in the name of someone, the name of someone, the name of someone. Now, they're doing the good thing, right? They're giving. They're doing the right thing. They're giving for the ministry of the Lord. But when we do it in such a way that we have to be the ones that receive the praise, and it's in our honor, then we are stealing the attention that belongs on God and his kingdom and shifting it to ourselves. Maybe that's why Jesus says when you give, give in private. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing because he knows the temptation to do that is subtle but it's always there it's always there in our selfishness and our self-centeredness and just our basic humanness our temptation is to put ourselves at the center of anything and everything we do then he gives a warning I tell you the truth they have received all the reward they will ever get You got the attention. That preacher with his $100 bill got the attention. That was its own reward. But the reward that comes from giving and an intimacy and a growing dynamic personal relationship with God that comes through daily and simple and humble humility and obedience to God. Giving because we're worshiping, not because we're getting something out of it. Giving because we're participating in God's kingdom building, not because we're getting something out of it, but because it is an act of obedience to God, an act of worship, a daily deepening of our relationship with the Father. So let's look on, starting at verse 5 through 8. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, pray to your father in private, then your father who sees everything will reward you. This is my favorite part. When you pray, don't babble on and on <laughs> as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask. Do you think Jesus might have had a common experience in mind? That when they would go to the temple or they would go to synagogue and the prayer time would happen, they had, when Jesus mentioned this, maybe they got a picture in their mind of somebody they knew. <laughs> have you ever? It's a dangerous way to put it, y'all. You ever been to Sunday school class? No, let's, let's take that off the, have you ever, well, no, Sunday school, church, somewhere in the community, 
and, and you, you hear that so-and-so is going to pray, and your thought is, oh, Lord, I don't have the endurance for this one. <laughs> I remember going to a community gathering five or six years ago, and I, I, there was a, a woman in the community that looked at me and said, is, 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 is so-and-so speaking today? And I said, no, I think they're out of town. She went, oh, thank God. It doesn't take a lot of words to get to the heart of what you're praying, right? And he says, don't pray in such a way that the object of your prayer, that where it looks like you're doing is you're praying really to yourself. That's what they're saying here, right? You go into the synagogue, you go into the temple, you go into the place of worship, and they're praying loudly out loud. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying, praying out loud. There's nothing wrong with praying with others. We need to do that. It's an essential way of being in community together. But when we pray in such a way that our audience is the other people around us, and when they're looking at us, they're going, oh, look how spiritual he is, or probably that's what we think they're thinking, then who we're really praying to in that moment is us. That's the heart of what he's talking. He says, when you pray, go into your prayer closet, go into a room, close the door, do it in private, so that your primary place of prayer is between you and God, this communication with the Father, between you and Him, and it's intimate, and it's dynamic, and it's personal, and it's in some ways private, though it's not always or ever completely private in our prayers, but focus more on Him than on what you're getting out of it. Prayer is primarily relational, not transactional. Let me say that again. Prayer is primarily relational, not transactional. Do you know what I mean by that? A lot of times we, when we pray, we treat God like he's some sort of cosmic Santa Claus. Right? Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's fine. He wants to hear our requests. He, he, he wants us to bring our needs to him, even though he already knows all of our needs. But the purpose of prayer is always the deepening of our relationship with God, not what we can convince God to give us. It's always relational before it's anything else. And so Jesus is again using this, this illustration, this image of the hypocrites who go and pray publicly and they make a show out of it so that everybody is looking at them. He says, I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. That's the second time he said that. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door, do it in private, focus on that relationship. Third section. Turn all the way down, look all the way down at verse 16. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. Do you see the same pattern developing here? When you fast, I think you could say this about any of the spiritual disciplines, right? It's not that other people are going to see you fasting. It's not that the other people are going to see abstains that are all the different spiritual disciplines. It's something you're doing to connect with God, not something you're doing to impress others. When you fast, don't make it obvious. This one actually makes me laugh. Just a little bit, because I get this image in my head of the guy coming into the group. <laughs> Hair is kind of sweaty, starving, right? And what does he do when he comes in? Somebody looks at him and goes, are you all right? You, you doing all right? You, Ken, you're, uh, you're not looking good today, brother. You, you doing all right? And what do they say back? Oh, I, I'm fine. I'm fasting unto the Lord today. I'm just fasting. Why do you tell somebody that? I'll tell you why you tell somebody that. So they'll look over at you and go, good job, Ken. I'm proud of you. 
That's wonderful. You're doing a great job in fasting. That's wonderful. What a, what a holy and devout man you are. They make a show out of it. I don't know that we do that so much with fasting. Sometimes we do it with praying. Sometimes we do it with attitudes of ways in which we worship. I think a lot of us today, and maybe it's preachers, but it's not just preachers. We do it in busyness. We walk into the room and somebody says, hey, how you doing today, Pastor Rich? Oh, I'm doing good. You know, I'm 100 miles an hour every direction. I'm really just going everywhere I can go every chance I get. Why, do, why, why would I do that? Why would a pastor do that? Oh, you're so busy. Look how awesome it is that you are so busy and so active and giving so much of yourself for serving the Lord. You're wearing, your, you're wearing yourself out and you're about to burn out and you're not healthy and your blood pressure's up, but God bless you. You're doing great. It's the principle there. We're making public what's supposed to be a private action. Now, there are times when we should, in agreement with one another, fast and pray. Where we should seek the Lord in that intentional kind of a way together. But even in doing that together in a time of fasting and prayer in a corporate sense, it's to turn the attention not just of myself but of the whole congregation on God and to seek His will, not mine. That's what fasting is about. That's what prayer is about. That's what giving is about. That's what the entirety of the spiritual life is about. It's about being conformed to the image of Jesus, the image of the one who was completely selfless, the one who served sacrificially, who went to the cross on our behalf, died in our place, rose from the dead. That's who we emulate. We're not out to build our own platform. We're not out to build our own brand. We're out to turn ourselves, our culture, our community, our churches, our people to Jesus and only to Jesus. And it begins with how we practice the faith, right? So did you see that pattern, the pattern of the problem? In each of the passages, they're turning the attention that should go to God to themselves. And I think we can all see that's not just their problem some 2,000 years ago. It's our problem as human beings today. It's a human problem that comes back generation after generation after generation. It's the problem of simple selfishness or self-centeredness or just a hurt or a brokenness in us that needs something from somebody else. And so we seek it from other people, their affirmation, their pat on the back, their words of accolade, instead of seeking it in relationship with God. We're not that different from those people that Jesus was first talking to. We're not different from them really at all. We often put ourselves at the center of what we do. It's not uncommon for people to do good things just to get the praise of others because it makes us feel good about ourselves. So what's the cure? What's the solution? I think that's what Jesus says in the middle of this section. Turn to the Lord's Prayer right there, starting at verse 9. Pray like this. I think if you look at this prayer as more than just the words that are there, but also the attitudes that are behind it, the position that is behind it, I think it solves all of it. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. The prayer starts with acknowledging who's in charge and who's holy. Our Father names him the perfect heavenly Father. May your name be kept holy. <laughs> Not my name, but yours. Not my reputation, but yours. May your kingdom come soon. It's the, the whole Sermon on the Mount is kingdom attitudes. What it means to be a part of the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdoms of this world. May your kingdom come, not mine. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, Father, not mine. That's, I think, one of the hardest things for you and I to get a hold of for any human being, but maybe even more so in our culture today. We want what's ours, our rights, our stuff, our desires, our plan, our path. We want to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, make it on our own, and do it our way. And the Lord's Prayer is a way of saying, my way is never really going to work. But I've got to turn to God and in the power of the Holy Spirit be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's a, an image of humility, right? 
of simple submission to God and the work that he wants to do. For he is the Father and he is the one who is holy. It is his kingdom that we advance and it is his will that needs to be done, not our own. Only after acknowledging all of that does the prayer then turn, now, Lord, give us today the food we need. (laughs) Not necessarily everything we want, but what our needs are, right? And then he says, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Have you ever noticed in the Lord's Prayer that's conditional? That our receiving and experiencing the fullness of forgiveness is somewhat contingent on us being willing to forgive others. That's a stepping on toes moment for me. You ever find your grudge, holding a grudge and, and wondering why I can't get deeper in the spiritual life? Why I'm feeling not just estranged from this other person, but I'm feeling like my relationship with God's not going any deeper either. Maybe it's because we have taken up offense and unforgiveness, refused to forgive. By the way, there is no such thing as forgive and forget. (laughs) There are some things that we need to forgive that we shouldn't forget. We don't put ourselves into places where we might be vulnerable and victimized again. But forgiveness is about releasing ourselves from the oppression of the enemy and maybe from others. So sometimes we need to forgive because we, in our unforgiveness, are putting a block in our relationship with God. And we're not going deeper with him because we're holding unforgiveness towards someone else. Then verse 13, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Don't let us yield to temptation. I want that to be my prayer, don't you? Lord, don't let me yield to temptation. But let's be honest, human beings. We, we often, <laughs> we might say that with our lips, but if you look at what's happening in our culture, we're not asking God to protect us from temptation. We're running headlong into it at every opportunity. All right? Temptation to what we watch on TV or the internet. Temptation to how we spend our money and how we do what we do in our lives. Temptation is all around us. And I think we say with our mind, we know that we should not give in to the temptation to sin in all these different ways. But if we're honest with ourselves, far too often, we're not even trying to avoid it. We're running headlong into it. And here in the Lord's Prayer, don't let us yield to temptation. It's an acknowledgement that temptation is going to be there, right? There is no living this life without experiencing temptation. There is no being a Christian and following Jesus without experiencing temptation. But we have the one, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, who will inhabit us and give us the strength and the power to avoid the temptations that come our way. By the way, God never tempts us. Temptations come because we're human and we're fallen people. God doesn't put that in front of us. God doesn't tempt us. But don't let us yield to temptation. And then verses 14 and 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So he just really repeats verse 12, doesn't he? Makes it just a little bit more explicit. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive, don't expect to experience forgiveness yourself. So if the problem, the challenge we face is that we are all broken and sinful people who are self-centered and selfish at the core at some level, and that even when we give and we're doing good things, even when we pray and we're doing it right, even when we're fasting and we're doing all of the good things, oftentimes we find ourselves doing it for us, putting ourselves at the center. And then God gives us this prayer that turns us away from self and on to who he is in his holiness, in his love, in his provision, focusing us on him and then reiterating our own need of forgiveness in order to feel and experience and know the fullness of forgiveness in our own lives. So there it is, there's the pattern. Oftentimes in practicing the spiritual life, we do it for us. 
And even Jesus said to us, take up your cross daily, die to yourself and follow me. The way out of that, the way out of that brokenness is a turning in humility towards God to focus on him. So how might I put this differently? For 12 and a half years, every sermon I ended essentially the same way. Those of you that have been here for a while, what's coming? The main thing. <laughs> the main thing, all right? Except I've been gone a while, so I've got two. Number one, your motives matter. Your motives matter. Why you do something is sometimes even more important than what it is that you do. You've got to know why you're doing it. Are you seeking Jesus with everything you are? Are you inviting the Holy Spirit to conform you into the image of Jesus? Are you putting God at the center of everything or yourself at the center of everything? Your motives matter. And the second is just a piece of advice. Choose your audience wisely. Choose your audience wisely. Are you seeking to please God? Or are you seeking to please yourself by getting the accolades of others? Choose your audience wisely. Your motives matter. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we need you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Even in this very moment, root out of us anything that displeases you. Anything that holds us back from a deeper relationship with you. Remake us and breathe again into us the breath of life that creates us, that recreates us, that redeems and restores us. Help us to love you more fully than we ever have before. Help us to know your grace in ways we've never known before. And Lord, when we give, when we pray, when we fast, when we do anything in the spiritual life, let us be fully focused on you our Savior, our friend, our God. Amen.
amen. Did Rich already slip out? I asked him if he wanted to go to the foyer, and he, like, went to the foyer. Anyway. I didn't know we are supposed to have a main thing. I'll start incorporating that into my sermons. It's always good to hear the word of the Lord in his house, is it not? Let us profess our faith in the Lord together in the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under... 